Hello, a belated Happy New Year and welcome to the January edition of the Bloody Scotland Book Club. I'm Abir Mukherjee, author of the Wyndham and Banerjee series of novels set in Rajira, India, and I'll be your host for the evening. Tonight I am joined by three wonderful guests and together we'll be reviewing books by Booker Prize nominated Belinda Bauer, winner of the 2021 Bloody Scotland debut of the year Robbie Morrison and the award winning and best selling Megan Abbott. We'll be taking you on a journey ranging from the cutthroat world of 1930s Glasgow to the well, just as cutthroat world of amateur ballet uh, and uncovering the dark secrets of some pensioners in the south of England. Um, but this is a live and interactive book club uh, and your participation is vital. So before I introduce my guests and the books, uh, I want to thank you for joining the book club. Thank you if you've uh, maybe read some of the books and whether you have or not, please do put your questions and comments in the chat function. If you have a question, please put it in capitals. That will make it easier for us to spot. Um, and we'll, be, we'll do our best to factor them in into the discussion. Um, we'll go through each book one at a time and we'll also hear from each of the authors reading from their books. So on with the show. Tonight I am joined by an esteemed and wonderful panel. Uh, Lee Randall is an editor, presenter, freelance writer, interviewer and festival programmer. And if you've been to a literary festival in Scotland, chances are Lee played a role in organising it. Uh, author Zoe Venditozzi is a full-time teacher and presenter of the Witches of Scotland podcast. Her first novel, Anywhere is Better Than Here, won the Guardian newspaper's Not the Booker Prize, and she is currently working on a new novel about madness and psychic phenomena. Or I'm guessing that's probably done by now, Zoe, is that right? Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much. And I'm joined by Jonathan Whitelaw, who is an author, journalist and broadcaster. After working on the front line of Scottish politics, he moved into journalism. He's the author of best-selling novels, Hellcorp and the sequel, The Man in the Dark. Welcome to you all. Hello. Thank you for having us. How, how are you all? How is January treating you? Mm, I'm really Full of COVID. COVID. Well, well, it was full, it was full of COVID. I'm I'm fully recovered now. Well, that's that's a relief. That's a relief because yes. you know we don't want to catch it from you on this. No, a computer virus. No, it's a uh, no, it's not. It's not. I, I I've been I've 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 been sitting on that gag, uh, all month actually. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And so th th thank you for letting me get it out of there. Have you all got a drink? Yes. What, uh, well, I'm still in the water. I'm still the uh, COVID recovery water. And what are you drinking, Zoe? What have you got there? tea so boring i wish it was something more exciting well you know that's what these book clubs are all about it's about the alcohol it's about the drink. A snowball. <laughs> yes, a snowball a baby sham it's my drink of choice <laughs> and lee what are you drinking have you got a drink there i've let the team down i'm on the water as well oh my goodness me yeah. well i i have whiskey because you know good, i'm, I'm alcoholic um, <laughs> <laughs> and on that bombshell, let's get to it, shall we? Um, our first book tonight is The Turnout by Megan Abbott. Uh, I'll tell you a wee bit about it from the cover. Uh, with their long necks and matching buns and pink tights, Dara and Marie Durant have been dancers since they can remember. Growing up, they were trained by their glamorous mother, uh, founder of the Durant School of Dance, after their parents' death in a tragic accident, the sisters began running their school together along with Charlie, Dara's husband, and once their mother's prized student. The three of them have perfected a dance that keeps the studio thriving. But when a suspicious accident occurs just at the onset of the school's annual performance of the Nutcracker, um, anxiety and exhilaration, uh, an interloper appears and threatens their delicate balance. Before we get into it, let's hear from Megan reading from the turnout. Hi, this is Megan Abbott, and I'm going to be reading a little bit from the turnout. This is just the very beginning of the book. They were dancers their whole lives, nearly. They were dancers who taught dance and taught it well as their mother had. Every girl wants to be a ballerina. That's what their brochures said, their posters, their website, the sentence scrolling across the screen in stately cursive. 
The Duran School of Dance, established in 1986 by their mother, a former soloist with the Alberta Ballet. The school took up the top two floors of a squat, rusty brick office building downtown. It had become theirs after their parents died on a black ice night more than a dozen years ago, their car roaming across the highway median. When an enterprising local reporter learned it had been the, their 20th wedding anniversary, he wrote a story about them, noting that their hands were interlocked even in death. Had one of them reached out to the other in those final moments, the reporter wondered to readers, or had they been holding hands all along? All these years later, the story of their parents' end, passed down like lore, still seemed unbearably romantic to their students, less so to Marie, who, after sobbing violently next to her sister Dara through the funeral, insisted, I never saw them hold hands, not once. But the Durants had always been exotic to others, even back when Dara and Marie were little girls, floating up and down the front steps of the big old house with the rotting gingerbread trim, the one everyone called the Hansel and Gretel house. Dara and Marie with their long necks and soft voices, their matching buns and duck-footed gait, swathed in scratchy winter coats, their pink tights dotting the snow. Even their names set them apart, sounding elegant and continental, even though their father was an electrician and a living room drunk, and their mother had grown up eating mayonnaise sandwiches each meal, as she always told her daughters, head shaking with rue. From kindergarten until fifth and sixth grade, Dara Marie had attended a spooky old Catholic school on the east side, the one their father had insisted upon, until the day their mother announced that going forward she'd be giving them lessons at home, so they wouldn't be beholden to the school's primitive views of life. Their father resisted at first, but then he came to pick them up at the schoolyard one day and saw a boy, the meanest in fifth grade, with a birthmark over his left eye like a fresh burn, trying to pull Marie's pants down, purple corduroys, to Dara's matching pink. Marie just stood there staring at him, her fingers touching her forehead as though bewildered, transfixed. Their father swerved over so fast his Buick came up on the curve, the grass, everyone saw. He grabbed the little boy by the haunches and shook him until the nuns rushed over. What kind of school, he wanted to know, are you running here? On the car ride home, Marie announced that she hadn't minded at all what the boy had done. It made my stomach wiggle, she said, more quietly to Dara in the back seat. Their father wouldn't talk to Marie for days. He telephoned the school and thundered at the principal so loud they heard him from upstairs in their bunk beds. Marie's face in the moonlight was shiny with tears. Marie and their father were both mysterious to Dara, mysterious and alike somehow. Primitive, their mother called them privately. They never went back. Thank you. Wow, what an opening. Um, who'd like to kick us off on this? I'm, I'm looking at you, Lee. Lead, lead us off on this one. You're looking at me. I, I made a few notes. Um, I loved the book. I also love ballet, and I know that those two facts are inextricably linked. Um, it's an immersive, it's an overripe, almost gothic story set in this world. Many people think ballet is sweet and gentle and lovely, but anybody who really knows about ballet knows it's brutal. Everything about it is brutal, except for its effect on the imaginations of little girls and people like me who sit in the audience transfixed by this beauty. Um, I really enjoyed the fact this is one of several recent books that I've read that look at the cost of that beauty. The others are uh, the UK's very own Erin Kelly, whose book Watch Her Fall I thought was terrific, and um, Georgina Pazkogan's memoir Swan, Draw Swan Dive, which also depicts some of the scenes that could have come right out of Megan Abbott's book. Um, so it's set in suburban America, We've got these sisters who have inherited this rambling, ramshackle old house, a ballet school, and a legacy of mind fuckery from their parents. Um, the family dynamic is a huge, huge element of this. And there are, of course, as in any novel, layers and layers of secrets to unpick. Um, of course, in the classic you know, tradition, into this mix comes this disruptive outsider who inflames desires and causes alliances to shift within the, um, the threesome of Charlie, Dara, and Marie. And really, really, my phrase is, shakes the rug. 
stuff falls out. Um, the story sort of like leaps and folds, it, it opens and shuts a bit like I kept thinking about Odette in the, in the dying throes of the dying swan. Um, because again, you know, it's all tutus and sugar plum fairies and sweetness and light, but if you've ever seen a picture of a dancer's feet or if you know anything about what they have to do to their toe shoes to make them wearable, their ballet is brutal and there's pain and intensity. Um, so Maggie Shipstead, who's The Great Circle, is another fantastic book. She reviewed it for the New York Times and she pointed out that um, every single thing about ballet is heightened. There's the audience sitting in the dark and there's these dramatic melodramas unfolding on stage. All of that is in this book. Um, and it's also a book about the, the really dark side of femininity. Um, I'm gonna, as much as I loved it, I'm gonna say that Abbott makes nonstop unsubtle links between ballet and sex. And she really, really drives home the point that this is a book about women's relationship to their bodies and their appetites and to each other. There's a lot in the book about uh, female rivalry. And I found an interview where Abbott said that one of the inspirations for the book was the Dirty John podcast, um, because that revealed the impulse of women to judge one another, most especially about their relationships. Um, so why do I think that this is such a great fertile ground for crime fiction. Whenever I read about ballet dancers and what they endure, the injuries, the eating disorders, the abuse, I start to feel really guilty about how much I love it. I really love it. I love the toe. I see a toe shoe and I kind of get all fuzzy inside, <laughs> a bit like Marie when the boy pulled her pants down. Um, and for me, that's exactly the affinity it has with crime fiction because Many, many crime novels ask us to, they question, they put a flame to our morality. So we might find ourselves rooting for a killer who we particularly like, and we want them to get away with the crime, or we find ourselves hoping that the victim is going to kill the killer, or the cop is gonna kill the killer. We, we get kind of bloodthirsty as crime fiction readers. And for me, that it just, it's the same thing as, as ballet. I'm watching these lovely tutus and toe shoes and I'm forgetting that these women's feet are bleeding inside the shoes. Um, so there's that. What's wrong with it? I'm sure, I suspect we didn't all love this book. It is OTT. There are moments where I think she over eggs her pudding, you know, and I can see how melodrama is not up everybody's alley. Um, but personally, I thought this was totally immersive and totally riveting. Well, that's that's a wonderful introduction to the book. As, as you rightly pointed out, um, we're not here to, to praise authors or to be cheerleaders. We're gonna have a discussion. Who would like to, to give us their views next? I'm looking at you, Zoe. Right. What did you okay. think? I, I wanted to really love it. I love American fiction. I love where it was set. I love the idea of the two sisters and then the interloper, but I did feel that it, it went on a bit too much about Marie's hot sex life with the interloper builder, which I found a bit like, okay, I get it. Okay, she's bruised. I get it. You've seen her, blah, blah. I found that a bit tedious. It picked up a bit when when something happens towards the end of the book. And I was like, finally. Um, but I, you know, she's obviously, she's a really great writer. Um, it, it went along really interestingly. I'm not one of the little girls that, well, I'm a woman, obviously, but I wasn't a little girl that loved ballet. I was in fact chucked out of ballet because I wouldn't shut my pie hole and focus on the dancing. So I'm not a ballet lover at all. My daughter was never really a ballet lover. So it's, it doesn't have that kind of resonance for me. But I was thinking about a friend of mine whose daughter was a ballet dancer and took it quite far. And I thought she might actually really enjoy this. What I found really interesting was the rivalry as you picked up Lee between the girls and how horrible they are hard to each other. That the bit is the bit that's most interesting to me. The really, really awful things that I presume are true, the way that they sort of attack the girl who gets promoted um, to, to lead to lead part the way they treat her. I find that really fascinating. So it, I didn't love it overall, but there was a lot to admire about the book. A lot to admire. I think that, I think that's a really good phrase and, and, and a good way of, of, of summarizing this book. Um, Jonathan, what are your thoughts? 
Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree with Zoe. Um, I kept feeling that I was getting sidetracked by being by being dragged into every minute detail of everything that was going on. You know, I, I, that I, I don't want that to a uh, come across as me not being appreciative of how well it's written because it's it, because it's beautifully written. Uh, I, 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 and and the, the the language that's that's used and, and the imagery and all the rest of it is 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 genuinely beautiful and it's a beautifully written book. Um, I think yeah, I, I I agree with Zoe. I I think I just wanted things to kick on a little bit. You know, the the the, the passage that, that that we just heard there is a really really good example of it. You know, that's the that's the first what five pages, six pages. And already we've gotten all that exposition of 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 what the kids were like when they were younger, getting dragged out of school and all the rest of it. We're going into quite gra you know graphic detail, uh, and it continues to be graphic actually, uh, from what I recall from um, from from where it stops, and that carries on throughout it. And again, I, you know, I, I I I'm not a prude. Um, he he says. Uh, my problem, my issue wasn't with the the kind of graphic nature of 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 what's described in it, whether it's the you know the the, the wreckage of, of people's bodies, the, the the societal element, the sex elements of it as well, I just wanted it to carry on a little bit. It felt just a little bit, you know, what, let, let's let's get on with the story at times. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult. It's difficult for me to say that because because I, I as much as I'm saying that I wanted to get on with the with the story, I I, I still thoroughly enjoyed the, the the writing. I still thoroughly enjoyed the, the language of it. So yeah, I, I I again I think I'm with Zoe in that I I think I wanted to like it a lot more than I actually did. Um, and obviously you know I'm as someone who who does enjoy the ballet, maybe not to. Well, not as much as probably not as, not as much, much as, as I should. To. Not as much as you used to. Not as used to. I used to know. I don't. I don't have the. Don't have the. Not with these knees. <laughs> um, but uh, as anyone at the Bloody Scotland football will attest to. <laughs> um, but the yeah, it, it it is it is a toxic culture, isn't it? And uh, uh, and it reminds me of, of talking about football. Talk, you know, it reminds me of any sort of professional competition. Uh, you know, a, a, a good friend of mine um, who was a sports journalist. He always said that he couldn't watch documentaries about football um, because he just wanted to sit and watch it and enjoy the 90 minutes of the game because as soon as you step off that pitch it's completely toxic you know it's a meat market it's you're you're, you're trading in human lives from a very very young age uh, and it's this you know very very similar in the, in the ballet world very very similar in the, in the performing arts world very very similar in the, you know in, in a whole raft of, of particularly entertainment industries mm -hmm. uh, and I think that I mean that does come across don't get me wrong that, that that's that, that that's that is very much uh, put at the forefront it's, it's definitely not shied away from but yeah I, I think that was my my overarching feeling was that I just I was desperate to enjoy it a lot more than actually what I what I what I turned out to to, to enjoy. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's it's somewhere in the middle. I, this is a book of, you know, to, to pick up on the football analogy and mangle it, this is a book of three parts, isn't it? There's the first third where you think this is, a, you know, as somebody who's never had anything to do with ballet, never found it of any interest whatsoever, I found Megan Abbott's writing, you know, so powerful that I was, I was, I was loving it. I was enjoying understanding this world that I'd never thought of. You know, as you say, Lee, the fact that these beautiful, beautiful people are dancing on bloody deformed feet. The fact that their whole lives, um, you know, most of their lives are about pain, you know, and that they're deformed from this. All of that was was fantastic. Um, but it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. And you, you, you're sitting there after the first third thing and you're hearing about the same pain and the same deformities. And then this continues, I think, until the end of about two thirds of the way through, you have the defining moment. And that's the moment that you've all been referring to, the moment that we're all waiting for. Um, and then it picks up again uh, and it comes to this, you know, this denouement. But getting there is extremely difficult, especially after that first third. And if you're not interested in ballet, I wonder how many people would keep going to get that payoff. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it's one of these books where you can see the it's beautiful in its way, um, but it could I think the plot itself isn't isn't enough to carry the whole book. I was going to say it's maybe a bit unfair really to think of it in under the same umbrella of crime fiction because really it's leaning more towards literary fiction. It's kind of character driven, yeah. you know. Like Lee said, it's gothic. It's 
it's about a really kind of micro focus on these two dysfunctional sisters really and, and about the way in which their relationship doesn't work and slowly we understand why really it doesn't work but it's it's it it's pretty compelling, but I definitely did want it to just hurry up and get on with it. But that's maybe because we're reading it under the auspices of a, of a crime club. If I just read the book, not really think of it as crime, maybe I would feel a bit differently. I, I think that's fair. Uh, uh, but the blurb on the front leads you in a certain direction as well. But yeah, you're right. It, it leans towards literary fiction. And it, for what the relationship between the sisters, uh, as, you, as you pointed out, the, that hothouse element that competitiveness that she she's brought that out brilliantly now we have, we've got a question here from uh, rona uh saying did anyone on the panel find this a really uncomfortable read it's definitely memorable and and we've we've touched on this but what do you what do you think panel was it uncomfortable reading for you it wasn't me wasn't exactly uncomfortable i wonder if rona's maybe referring to like the huge amount of like sex chat about you know about the state of the sister after they'd had sex. There was a lot of that, of like physically the after effects. Um, I find that a bit tedious. And again, like Jonathan, not not necessarily because it's prudish to, I just felt it kind of went on a bit. I think it was yeah. that more than anything. Yeah. And, well, and the, sim the, the, the metaphors and the similes were just overused. You know, the, yeah. the, the, the picture, the, the, you know, the imagery that she was using, it was sort of used, you know, it was a sledgehammer over our heads at certain points. Um, yeah, at, at a great many points, as much as I love the book, yes, at a great many points, every single thing is redolent with symbolism. It's like you can't, that's why it's claustrophobic in a weird way. You can't get away from, you know, even the fact that the two main male characters are both physically damaged, you know, Charlie, has been so destroyed by the dance that he's basically held together by pins and willpower and he can't actually move his body. And um, Derek, the um, interloper, he walks with a limp and it's like, well, how much more symbolism could we get? <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm still here to wave the flag for it. Or the tutu. I'm waving my tutu for it. Yeah, okay, well, let's, let's put it to a vote. Um, we're gonna do this on three levels. We have two thumbs up for really good, one thumb, or none at all, right? So where are we going? Two thumbs up, one, one. I would say one as well. Mm. One's think, habit. I think, yeah, so one's out, it. out of a possible, what, eight votes, we got three and two's five. So that's not bad, that's not bad at all. And let's be honest, there is there are things about this book which are very, very beautiful, very, very well done. It makes, you, it makes you work. Other stuff by her though. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I haven't read anything else by Megan Abbott, yeah. and I think I'd like to see her obviously like sophisticated, fantastic writing with a different subject. I, I will say from my my research, it sounds like a lot of her books. There's one set in the world of cheerleading, for example. I think oh. a lot of it's to do with women and rivalry and that kind of thing. I think that's well, I think a, also the amount of research that she must have done into this was was must have been yeah. you know, amazing. It's, it, it's the type it's the type of book that. You know, well, I might not have enjoyed it plot wise. I, I came away from it being utterly jealous that ah. I can't write like that. You know, <laughs> that's the, and the it makes it makes me want to write better, and and that that's a you know that that's probably the best compliment. Does it make you want to put on a tutu, Jonathan? Is the question? <sighs> well, why, why, who who doesn't want to put the tutu on? <laughs> The, the problem I've got is nobody wants to see me in a tutu. That's, the, you know, <laughs> well, give the Jonathan. people what they want. Well, we've got an audience. If anybody would like to see Jonathan in a tutu, please write in. Um, let's see how many people for or against. Okay, oh. let's move on. Let's move on to our next book. We've got Edge of the Grave by Robbie Morrison. Um, now, Robbie Morrison is better known as a writer of sci-fi and graphic novels, uh, especially his work in the comic 2000 AD. Um, so historical crime fiction is a bit of a departure for him and we are lucky that he decided to turn his hand to it because Edge of the Crave is a sparkling debut which has already a Waterstone Scottish book and uh, it was also chosen as the Bloody Scotland Scottish Crime Debut of 2021. Uh, let's tell you a wee bit about the book set in Glasgow in 1932. Uh, it's a city still recovering from the Great War, split by religious division and swarming with razor gangs, um, when the son-in-law of one of the city's wealthiest shipbuilders is found floating in the River Clyde with his throat cut. 
It falls to Inspector Jimmy Dreghorn to lead the murder case, despite sharing a troubled history with the victim's widow, Isla Lockhart. From the flying fists and flashing blades of Glasgow's gangland underworld to the backstabbing upper echelons of government and big business, Dreghorn and his partner, Bonnie Archie McDade, will have to dig deep into Glasgow society to find out who wanted the man dead and why. All the while, the sadistic murderer stalks the post-war city, leaving a trail of dead bodies in their wake. As the case deepens, will Dreghorn find the killer or lose his own life in the process? Let's hear from Robbie Morrison. Hi, thanks for including Edge of the Grave in the January Book Club and for giving it the Best Debut Award last year. Sparks rage through the darkness, then slowly fade. The smoke and ash are thick and cloying. I move through twisted metal and shattered bodies, the uniforms making them seem like one great ruptured mass. He stares at me with a faith I find touching. I say words that bring no comfort, powerless against the screams and moans, the roaring flames and desperate prayers. He is fair and beautiful, his skin smooth, his body opened up below me, insides wet and glistening. Flakes of ash fall on him, fading into his blood. I run a hand through his hair, smoothing it back into place. There, there, I say, and lean forward to kiss his brow, the flesh cold and damp. Our eyes meet, and his fear, his innocence, fill the emptiness within me. I cup his face in my hands and kiss him again, gently pushing my tongue past dry, cracked lips. At first, there's little more than cigarettes and whiskey and blood, but then, slowly, I begin to taste his life, almost as if it's my own. A birth in a squalid little tenement room, a woman's cries, a mother and father old beyond their years, working and breeding, breeding and working, pieces of the human machine. A childhood of struggle and hardship, but little complaint, just acceptance. Brothers and sisters in the same crowded bread bed, pissing into a chanty near overflowing by morning. Football in the streets with a ball of crushed newspaper. A job lined up, same trade as the father. The child becoming the man. The pattern unbroken, but for a patriotic call to arms and the embrace of a far crueler machine. I pull back the early morning air cool in my face. The faith and innocence in his eyes are gone. I take out my revolver and fire it into his beautiful face. I move on to the next one. He is older, not so trusting. He tries to crawl away, but his legs are ruined. Another explosion shakes the earth. All around us, shots ring out. They are there, I say. Right, well, who is going to lead us on this one? I'm looking at you, Zoe. Come on, tell us a wee bit about that. It's a little, little prop there in the background. I really, really enjoyed Edge of the Grave. I thought it was a really good kind of page turner. When I wasn't reading it, I was thinking about it. I wanted to get back to it and get on with it. I think the fact that um, that Robbie Morrison's been involved with um, with graphic novels means that it has definitely got a real kind of visual feel to it. I could, certainly could see things that were happening. And it did remind me of people like Philip Kerr, who handle historic, fit well handled historic fiction, historical fiction really well, because you can feel that it's research. They know what they're talking about, but not overplaying. You know, it's not like, and here is all this stuff that I found that I now must tell you about in the book. It still felt really kind of smooth and natural which I really enjoyed um I really liked the idea that you had this introduction with the gangs and you had that kind of overview of what was going on with them and then you had this you know slightly maverick slightly not not fitting in detective who was who was working things out and there's the two stories they're they're trying to solve the murder of um the son-in-law of one of the big shipbuilders who it turns out Jimmy's got a connection to, and then that's revealed both kind of, there's a romantic connection within the family and there's there's a connection in his past. But then he also takes on this kind of side job where he's trying to locate a missing person. So I really enjoyed the way they kind of wove together. And in the background, there's also somebody going around doing murders. 
And then there's some historical things that are that are discussed in there or covered in the book that I'd never heard about. And I was like, that's surely just completely made up. And then I looked it up. I'm not going to spoil it, but I looked up and I was like, my God, that's true. And I've never heard about that before, which I found fascinating. So I love it when you get real historical events that are then really seamlessly put in together with a really good, fast moving story. So I, I think that there's going to be a, a next part. I think it's going to be a series because I definitely finished it thinking I want to read another story now with, with Jimmy and with his with his sort of sidekick, which is the wrong word really for Archie because Archie's massive and Jimmy's small. <laughs> But, um, but I really like the setup and I really want, there's a there's a woman, there's a WPC in it who's called Ellen Duncan. And I really want to see Ellen, who I think that there is, there's definitely seeds being sown that she's going to take a bigger part, I think, in the, in the next one, if there is a next one. So I thought that was great. And there were a few female characters, which isn't always the case, unfortunately. But I think in this one, we, we did have a fairly good showing for feisty or kind of women characters. So there's a huge amount to admire about the book. I really liked it. And I'm very keen to read another one by him. I'm pretty sure there will be another one. Uh, I don't know why I think that, but I, I think I think he's mentioned he's working on a sequel. Um, which is great, and and that seems like a, a stellar, stellar view of the a review of the book. And uh, who am I going to come to next, Jonathan? What, why don't we give? Why don't we come to you? What did you think of it? I loved it. Yeah, I I, I really loved it. Um, pretty much from the off, I I again, you know, the, the, there's a deft touch to to being able to explain what is a very very messy, very very murky history of the city of Glasgow. Uh, I have to I have to admit though, you know, when we're talking about uh, a, a historical fiction book of a city that's ravaged by sectarianism and uh, street violence, you know, it's it's not quite it's not quite that far in the past, uh, and it's certainly you know uh, walking down our Gale Street on a Saturday night, you would uh, you might think that you'd uh, travel back in time or maybe not, but um, it, there's there's a wonderful sort of deft touch that that uh, that he has in this book, to, particularly at the start, you know, it it almost it's, it sets the scene perfectly and he takes you through this. Uh, this street by street guide as to who the local gang is that, that operates in that area and indeed what religion they are and in turn you know it, the, the, the flip-flop element of it which I love because it just sort of picks up pace it's like a, it's like a snowball effect and as you read it the more ridiculous it becomes but the, the thing is you know with this type of violence with this type of you know a tribalism um that was rife back then and again we could spend a whole other evening talking about how it's still rife now it, it, when you see it that way when you see that, that it's streets that separate these these, these people um it it, it just sort of highlights that it, it, in a very very subtle but still quite funny and hilarious way that that how, how pointless this all is and then of course you you jump into the plot as Zoe says you jump into you know a, a couple of fantastic plots my um my my gran used to stay in the gorbals uh, and and so i grew up in all of these streets you know she would pick me up from school and, and take me back to back to her house and we would walk down all these streets so it and, and it was before the thing is just a very very quick history lesson it was like in the 1990s so the gorbals as an area was was under regeneration so a lot of the a lot of the old you know all the kind of old day uh, uh, tenements had been knocked down in the sort of 50s and 60s and they built all the high rises and they were all starting to get knocked down as well so it, it was actually really really touching to, to be able to you know almost take a, a step back in time for, for myself um but yeah thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it I, I i think if i if i did have one gripe with the book was that you know it, it that there wasn't maybe enough uh, from the female characters you know I kind of get it. I understand it's the, what is it, 19, I've got it here, 1932. You know, it's a very, very male-dominated world. I, I get that. I completely understand it. And it's not a, it's not a criticism. Um, but I just, you know, it, 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 again, I agree with you, Zoe. I, 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 I'm looking forward to seeing more, more from the female characters. And, and we, we, were, we were just given that sort of tantalising taste of them. Actually, given the tantalising taste of, of all of them, it's, it's great. You, you've, you've got a wonderful sense of of the place again a massive 2000 AD fan and and the, the the great thing about that as a comic and all the writers that contributed to that over the years is, is that it was a it was a very British take on the kind of American superhero element of it and I got that vibe here as well you know that the, you, you never ever stray too far away from the uh, from that kind of tongue-in-cheek reality you know um 
but it's there's still a lot of enjoyment to be taken from it. And, and obviously, Robbie mentions in the, in his video there that um, it's nice and cheery. Uh, you know that that sort of kind of dark Glaswegian humour is 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 a is is written throughout. I, I, yeah, I, I thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was I thought it was great, brilliant read. Mm. Before I come to you, Lee, I just want to say to our audience, um, listen, if you've got any questions about this book, please do uh, put them in the chat, put them in capitals, and we'll, we'll come to them. Now, Lee, what did, you, what did you make of it? Well, this is why I get drummed out of the club, isn't it? Uh, this book and I, we didn't get along that well. I, I totally agree that the first couple of chapters had me gripped. And everything about this book should have spoken to me. I love historical fiction, historical crime fiction. I've lived in Glasgow myself, uh, you know, I was ready for it, but um, I kept feeling that I was in the company of a really good writer who couldn't get out of his own way. Um, I actually really disagree with you. I felt that the, there was were nonstop info dumps. I started making lists of when, at one point when he started explaining to me that the, um, National Socialists were Nazis. I was kind of like, you know, I think like 100% of the world knows that already. And for me, I want, I want my history more seamlessly integrated. And I just was frustrated because I know that impulse when you, when you learn a cool thing, you want to put it in, but I felt it could have been done differently. And the other problem I had was, um, I understand he's trying to write both a crime series and a family saga. I understand there's a dual intent behind it and I applaud that. Um, and there are a couple of moments where I was just like, yes, this is exactly right. I love this. I love this set piece. I love this moment. But I found that the whole back, the back and forth between the past and the present, I found the past episodes cliched. I found that I felt like I'd read them all before. They weren't illuminating the story or the characters for me and they kept slowing things down for me. So I actually found this book very put downable and I was really frustrated because at the same time, I was looking at it going, this guy can write. Why is this book giving me, why am, why am I wrestling with it? Why isn't it flowing for me? So it was very frustrating for me. I, I can I can understand what you're saying uh, about information. I mean, I, at one stage um, had to uh, research the Calcutta sewer system and went down a rabbit hole and and because i spent two days learning about the calcutta sewer system i had to put it in so <laughs> everybody knew about it. and obviously my editor just scored it all. But there, there is that urge you know nobody needs to know that much about the calcutta sewer system right but that there is that urge um let me tell you what i thought of it as a as a writer of historical crime fiction set in the same period i have to say i thought it was glorious I loved it, um, and, but you know I can understand what you're saying, Lee. There were I'll come to my my views on exposition, but it felt to me like this is the book about historical Glasgow that I have been waiting my whole life for somebody to write. Um, I, I I loved it. It's it's my sort of book. You know, it's the sort of book that I. I love to read. It's it's the sort of book I would love to write. You know, it's it's got everything that I want. It's it's got the history of a place that I love. It's got that great Glaswegian gallows humour um, that really keeps things going. Um, and there's those facts that Zoe mentioned. There are things that you know us growing up and loving Glasgow. The things that I didn't know about Glasgow that are in this book, and I found them brilliant. Um, on the other side of it. Okay, because we have to be balanced. Yes, I think there were there were there were areas there where there was exposition. So, as you said, the Nazis. Uh, there was there was a bit about Roosevelt and prohibition, and and there were these. But the, but the, you've got to remember, this is a debut crime novel. Okay, and I'm sure, uh, and it's a it's a much more <laughs> assured debut than mine was. Uh, so I'm not one to criticise. These are things that you know are, are just you know the last rough around the edges. My one question would be, um, as for somebody who's not from Glasgow and doesn't love Glasgow the way that we all do, would it be as interesting? And I, I can't answer that. But if you're if you're Glaswegian, if you're Scottish, yeah, there, there's there's what's always perturbed me is why don't we have why isn't Glasgow as big in literature as Edinburgh is? when to me it's a far more interesting city. Uh, and this book captures 
some of the essence of Glasgow, which I've not seen captured, or I haven't seen captured before. And I, there's so many points where I went, yes, this is what I want to see. So um, just thoughts on that before we go to questions. What did what do you think? Do you think it would appeal as much to somebody who isn't a Ouija or isn't in love with Glasgow the way we are? One, one thing I was going to say was that I, I mean, I, I was very aware of that. I was very aware of that kind of Glasgow fanboy element of it, of, of me reading it, you know, and, and and I did try my best to 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 try and park that to one side and enjoy it, you know, the same way that I would have if it was set in Birmingham or it was set in Dublin or it was set in London or it was set in Manchester or what have you. Um, but I found it really, really difficult. And, and actually listening back to myself there, I clearly wasn't able to do that, you know, and 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 I I think it's I think it's really really interesting and, and interestingly, Lee, you know, you saying that you 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 said that you've, you've you've stayed in Glasgow, you know, um, yeah, it 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 it, it, it was really really hard for me to do, really really hard for me to do because because I was picturing it all and and putting on my own print of of living and loving in the the the, the city. And, I mean, but, I, look, I live. In- I lived in Glasgow when I was at university and uh, my oldest kid is is there now. He's at university and my husband is from Glasgow and I know it quite well, but I didn't know the area in which the it happened, where the story was happening. So for me, there wasn't like a massive, like the sort of the fetishizing of Glasgow. It wasn't like, oh, Glasgow, you're a wonderful place. Because I don't really feel like that about Glasgow. I really like Why it. Why not? <laughs> or prefer it to Edinburgh. That's as much as I'll, I'll give you. You know, in this sort of grudging way, but I, I, <laughs> somebody will. But I, <laughs> I, I enjoyed it. I liked the setting, and it felt real enough without being distracting to me of being like, oh, I know that street, or you know, that's that bit there, that's wrong, that or that bit's right. So it, I, it was, it was distracting, Zoe. It, it was. I, I did find it distracting. Yeah, I did. You know the city too well. You need I to sit in pit and weem. I. <laughs> I I almost at times, again, because of what I'm calling info dumps, I sometimes felt that this was a book. I wondered at times, did the London editors make him put this stuff in? I sometimes felt like it was a book written for people who couldn't find Glasgow on a map. And it was like intro to Glasgow, um, you know, 101. And, and I think maybe, weirdly, because I do know something about Glasgow and I have read other novels set in Glasgow at different points in history that I was kind of like, just get on with it. We know this. Everyone knows this. Everyone knows this. Everyone knows what it's like in the trenches in World War One. We've all seen the films and read all the other books. Come back and come back with McDade stuck in the teacup and give me more of that. I, I think I think there's a, a what you say is fair. I mean, there are parts of the book where the the, the World War One stuff, a lot of that has been done. But I, I loved I love the Glasgow elements. And this has started a debate online. We're getting quite a few comments and questions. Louise Colvin says, loved the Dreghorn character. Would love to read more by this author, uh, which I think we're going to get, Louise, which is all good. Rhoda Agnes says, loved this book. Would thoroughly recommend it. Historical setting worked well, despite grim, upsetting start. A real page turner for me and would definitely read more. Uh, Louise Colvin again comes back and says, the different connections are brilliantly entwined and I looked up the historical connections, so interesting. Um, Mary Carberry said, brilliant read, my favourite of the three books this month, can't wait for the next instalment. Uh, Louise has a question, when do you stop the research? (laughs) (laughs) Right, who's going to answer that one? When do you stop the research? When the deadline looms, and and you didn't get paid. (laughs) Zoe, when do you stop the research? Well, I I set things in contemporary settings, so I don't have to deal with that. (laughs) Well, I am I am researching historical thing just now, and I think the danger with it is is that you know it's like you're saying if you've spent all that time getting to know whatever the thing is. You want to say to people, listen to the thing that I've spent all this time getting to know. So I think that that is quite tricky. But I think that's surely where an editor should come into it and say, right, you're going on a bit here. So maybe what Lee's hypothesizing that the editors were like, local colour, give us the local colour. Tell us about those crazy glass regions. You know, if but we it might not even be like a London editor. That's terrible. Maybe the editor was glass region themselves and also just pure yeah. Glasgow and just wanted that to be carried across. So I don't know. I, I didn't find that, you know, but 
Well, it's yeah. funny you should mention local colour because when I was growing up in Hamilton, uh, we were the local colour. Uh, back, back the... <laughs> uh, Rhoda Agnes says, agree with Jonathan's comment. Somebody does, at least. It, My doesn't, God. it doesn't seem that far from current Glasgow. Still so many of the same sectarian problems, poverty, domestic violence. And I think that's a very fair point. I mean, this is Glasgow 80 years ago, and yet... There are elements of it that we still recognise, and 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 that's it's it's sobering, uh, and it, and it's important. Um, let's move on. We're, we're we're running short of time. Let's let's go to something a wee bit lighter. We've done we've done the depths of Glasgow in the cutthroat world of ballet. Now let's move to something written by one of my favourite authors, um, Exit by Belinda Bauer. Uh, Belinda Bauer's debut novel, Blacklands, won the CWA Gold Dagger. Her 2014 novel, Rubbernecker, won the Theakston's Old Peculiar Crime Novel of the Year. And in 2018, her novel, Snap, was long listed for the Booker Prize. So she has been, she's won or been nominated for pretty much everything. Now, Exit is the tale of Felix Pink, the most unlikely murderer you'll ever have the good fortune to spend time with. When Felix lets himself into number three, Black Lane, he's there to perform an act of charity, to keep a dying man company as he takes his final breath. But just 15 minutes later, Felix is on the run from the police after making the biggest mistake of his life. Now his world is turned upside down as he must find out who, if he's really to blame or if something much more sinister is at play, all the while staying one st shaky step ahead of the law. Let's hear from Belinda reading from the book. I assume she's going to read from the book. Felix Pink's days of buying clothes were over. He had bought his last pack of wife fronts a year ago, and the socks he had now would see him out. It was a strange feeling that he would be outlived by his socks. Although it had already happened with other things, of course, the last house, the last car, Felix wondered how finely he might judge it, how low he could go. The last can of shaving foam? The last jar of jam? He sometimes wondered whether his dying thought would be of a half pint of milk going to waste in his fridge. He had three suits, tweed, navy pinstripe and black, and five shirts, four white and one in muted country check, for outdoor pursuits supposedly, although he only ever wore it in the garden. Two pairs of slacks, one grey, one brown, three ties, and three pairs of shoes, to wit, brown brogues, shiny black funereals, and some misguided loafers, which he never wore because loafers of any type were anathema to him. He hung the Navy Mac on the rail next to a short beige zip-up jacket. Felix was at peace with most of his wardrobe, but the beige zip-up jacket still bothered him. Margaret had bought it from Marks and Spencer years ago, and he'd been secretly appalled. Felix was no adventurer, but he'd never dreamed that he would wear such a staid thing such an old man thing. He'd seen old men in that very jacket for decades, often with matching flat cap and walking stick. He had a hazy recollection of his father in the same jacket, and quite possibly his grandfather. The fact that Margaret had apparently felt the jacket was suitable attire for him at the age of 64 had come as something of a blow. The trouble was, he now wore it all the time. It was warm but not hot, it machine washed and dried in a jiffy, looking like new, and it went with everything else in his wardrobe, somehow making the smart look casual, and the casual look smarter. On principle, Felix had spent ten years looking for something more suitable to replace it with, when it finally wore out. But it never did wear out, and he was far too much a man of his generation to dream of discarding something when it was still entirely serviceable, even if he had an existential crisis every time he wore it. <laughs> Before we start, can I ask you a question? Whose dad has that beige jacket? Or had that beige jacket? Mine's dead. You? Well, my, mine's, mine's passed away as well, but he had that beige jacket. My dad saw himself as a PI. He would in no way have worn a jacket such as that. <laughs> my dad had it. What about yours, Jonathan? Did he not have it? Um, I think my granddad had it. I'm pretty sure my, my granddad's had it. Uh, not the same jacket. They didn't. They didn't. That wasn't like some sort of in-law, you know. A that would be that contract. Would be... They, they they had their own, you know, yeah. in various colours. But yeah, I, I know I know exactly the jacket. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Lee, Lee did you, is there somebody in your family that had this jacket? No, 
No. Right well, now. I I recognise this jacket now, and and Jonathan recognises this jacket. So it's only fair, Jonathan, that you leave it off. <laughs> on Lovely. Thank you. I I I I really enjoyed this. Now I, I'm gonna I'm gonna start it with a with a cards on the table moment because uh, I'm going to be hypocrisy manifest. Um, I said earlier on this evening about uh, the, the the first novel that I just wouldn't kick on and get on with the plot because it was going down the going down the kind of various routes, a la a Billy Connolly monologue. Um, now, Exit does exactly the same thing, and actually, that um, that reading there by Belinda was 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 exactly it. You know, suddenly we've gone from just having a jacket hanging up to, you know, why um, why it was bought. It's still being bought. It's been 10 years down. It feels as if you, it's taken 10 years to read to the end of it. Now, the difference for me in this case was that I really, really love that mundane element being made fantastic. And that goes on throughout this whole book. Um, don't get me wrong. There's a, there's, there's a, there are some serious questions that are raised from it. You know, just that without going into too many details, kind of too many spoilery details, our, our, our hero is part of the Exiteers group who essentially assist with people who are terminally terminally ill and are um wanting to die uh, and they, they they are there to be with them at the at the moment of their of their own suicide and they sign waivers and all the rest of it and of course it all gets very very complicated when the wrong person is given the the nitrous oxide or sorry i beg your pardon takes the nitrous oxide um and there's there's that sort of the the, the mundane and the fantastic sit beside each other very you know, sometimes unsteadily but sometimes perfectly in this book and and that's what i loved about it because i i i, I love that as a reader I, I i love that you know i'm a massive terry pratchett fan and arguably nobody did it as as well as he did um but this is in very much i say very much a much more realistic setting in that it's suburban southern england um as opposed to you know the, the disc world or what have you but you know th those th th those lines that we get and 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 that in fact I I was delighted that that was the passage that was that was mentioned because I because I wanted to talk about it you know the the idea that this seventy five year old man is is reflecting on he's bought his last pair of pants you know this carries on throughout the, the throughout the particularly throughout the, the start of the book uh, and there's a wonderful morality uh, mortality I beg your pardon to it um, and. I don't know. It really, it really struck a chord with me because I can see that jacket, and I've done that myself. I mean, I, I'm 35, but I do that with my own clothes. You know, there's, I, there's a jacket I've got hanging up in the in the cupboard that I think, well, I thought 10 years ago made me look too old. Now it gets worn all the time, and it's been worn all the time for the last 10 years. And as everybody can see, I'm hardly a fashion icon, you know. But it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it really struck a chord with me. This book, I, I found it. I found it a lot of fun. Um, and like I said, you know, hands on the table, uh, the cards on the table. I uh, I do acknowledge that it does go on a bit, but I I really enjoyed it. I I loved it going on. Well, there's a great line that you just said that the mundane made fantastic. Who's going to comment next, Lee? What did you think of it? Was it the mundane made fantastic? Absolutely. I I wish I could steal that phrase, but now that it's going out into the uh, internet, it's yours. Thing is, he forgot that I could have claimed it as mine. <laughs> I, I absolutely love the book. I love books that take serious subjects and deal with them humorously. Um, I love the fact that it was full of love and empathy for the characters, that it tackles big issues like, you know, people's right to choose the moment of their own death. That's something I feel very passionately about in life. So it was interesting to see it in the book. It looks at the fear we have of dying alone, um, which was interesting. And it also, it's a book that talks, it shows you for all its comical and farcical, you know, OTT elements, it does show you how innocent people can get really taken in. And there are moments where you just think, oh Jesus, do you know what? I could have easily have made that mistake myself yep. and just bumbled into this horrific situation. Um, and there were just some wonderful set pieces, you know, like people being hauled in for jail and they start confessing to one crime, but they've actually been brought in about something completely different and they have to backpedal. Um, but also yeah. the way the police treat this old gentleman when he's when he's in there, you know, and it's it's very different to the way the police would treat somebody who looks like me. But and to me, that was fascinating, <laughs> you know, yeah, um, yeah. but that's interesting. So carry on. No, no. I, I mean, I just really 
really liked it. And I thought the handling the police, you know, the Calvin Bridge character, I thought he was lovely as well, because you could see, you could see he was going to grow during the book. And that was going to be an interesting trajectory as well. So so I'm all for it. Zoe, what did you make of it? I really enjoyed it. And I, if I'd seen that in the shop and I'd been looking for a book to buy, I wouldn't have bought it. It just wouldn't have wouldn't have rung any bells for me. But I will definitely read more by Belinda Bower now after reading that. that. Apart from anything else, her names are totally brilliant. The names of the characters are great. They're they're quite bonkers, some of them, and they're they're really they're cool. And I think she mentions at the end in the acknowledgments that some of the names were taken from maybe her grand's friends. There was a couple of names from there. So I love that. I really enjoyed that. He he's a really adorable character. As I already said, my dad is dead, and so are my grandfathers. So I I am one of those people that moves through life. My dad was quite young when he died, so I moved through life kind of looking for replacement dads and granddads. And he would definitely make the make the show. List. He, he's just so sweet and I loved the relationship with the lady next door and it was just so it was really lovely and and but a big thorny issue though about sort of the end of life I've worked in palliative care had the privilege of doing that for a wee while um not as a doctor don't worry but as a as a writer in residence and so it was a really a beautiful thing to work with people towards the end of their lives now my uh, I'm going to mention my dad again my god he died of cancer and he had a really difficult end of life in many ways. And I just really believe really strongly that people should have their own agency with that. So I thought that was super interesting, the way that was dealt with at the beginning, the way it was all kind of cloak and dagger, um, that they didn't know each other. There was code names. And I thought that was totally brilliant and really interesting. So a very serious, serious issue, but then dealt with in, with lots of really nice, deft, light touches. I thought it was a really fab book. I really enjoyed it. Right, well, I have to tell you what I thought. Um, I, I started reading this book and five pages into it, my heart sank because I would love to have written a book this well. <laughs> and, on this, and, and when you read something, you think, this is exactly what I wish I could write, but I can't write. Um, this book was amazing for me. I, I love, to the extent that I sent her an email saying, I hate you, but I love you uh, because, um, this book, as as you said, Zoe, it, it deals with a very serious subject, but it deals with it in, in a way which is so warm and, and with so much deftness of touch and humour as well. And and as you picked up on, um, Jonathan, just the, the, the detail, the banal details, the small things that we gloss over, but when you bring them to light, we can all recognise. Um, and so, you know, you you, you were looking, you, you were seeing things. I saw my dad in the character. You know, so many of the mannerisms were my, and he's passed away as well, but so many of the mannerisms were, were my father's as well. And I just thought, this is beautiful. I love this. And this is the sort of book I wish I could write, uh, but I can't. If I have one gripe about it, the ending didn't really work for me. It I felt... know, I loved it. I was quite, it was, it was quite kind of, oh, you know, it, like it was definitely like a warm moment for me. I liked I it. Know, it was definitely, it was, it needed a warm moment. You're right. It needed that sort of ending, but it, to me, it just felt slightly contrived. And that's not taking away from it. As I say, this is, this is a book, this is a book that I loved uh, to the effect that I went and swore at the writer uh, on email. Um, as you do, because <laughs> she's not on Twitter. I had to send her an email. Um, but let's 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 see what what other people said. We've got Jackie says I listened to it on Audible and and she thought it was great. Um, Rhoda says brilliant book, devoured it in one day. Quirky take on mortality and people's right to choose. Funny, touching, great read. Um, I don't think we any of us would really disagree with that. Um, is there anything come on because you've all gushed about this book is there anything you would you would do slightly differently is there anything you would like to see done differently in this book is there anything that didn't chime with you i mean like initially i i was a bit like oh i don't think i'm gonna really get into this so maybe some people might start it and think oh this is maybe a wee bit precious or something i don't know but very very quickly i got quite into it and it was sweet and it was it was quite a nice it was quite a light reading and i don't mean that dismissively it's not a negative thing i enjoyed it january was hard it was nice to have something to read that i was enjoyed and i was connected with but i wasn't distressed by even though it is about a heavy topic in some and, ways and that's a skill in it and that's a oh, skill. Yeah. i mean that's why she's won pretty much every award out there um and why she's been nominated for the booker because 
she she can deal with such topics in in such an engaging way um we didn't uh, we'll have to come back to robbie morrison's edge of the grave but let's do our two thumbs test here so two thumbs one thumb or no thumbs two oh a full yeah. house sweep. eight for exit let's go back let's do robbie morrison's edge of the grave how many thumbs two I go sideways. Ooh. Can I do half of them? Okay, okay. So we, we've got we've got quite a spread there. We've got we've got three books that I think each of us enjoyed differently, um, and they were great books in their own way. We learned something from each of them. Before we finish tonight, um, let's look forward to next month's bloody Scotland Book Club, introduced by my good friend Gordon Brown, who looks like he's got a bit of a tan. Gordon, where are you? Tell us a bit about next month and, and where are you? Are you sitting in Spain or are you in Glasgow? I'd love to say a lie to you and tell you I'm sitting in Glasgow, but I'm not. I'm actually sitting in Spain and it was blue skies and 18 degrees today. Sorry, I just had to say that. It was lovely today. Anyway, as Avir said, my name's Gordon Brown, or I'm also called Morgan Cry, and I'm just on to tell you what we're doing next month. First of all, Avir, Jonathan, Lee and Zoe, thanks very much for that, because that was a great book hour. Really, really, really enjoyable. Uh, so next month, that's Wednesday, the 23rd of February, I'm going to be joined by Frankie Barr, Arusa Qureshi and Simon Lodge to chat about these three books, which is Neil Lancaster's Dead Man's Grave, Girl A by Abigail Dean, and Josephine, Josephine Tay's The Daughter of Time. So that's next Wednesday, 23rd of February, and those are the books that we'll be chatting about. Well, that's Bye. brilliant. That is uh, fantastic. Um, before we finish, uh, I should say that all the videos, including a reading by uh, Robbie Morrison uh, from Edge of the Grave, will be up on the website, on the, the Facebook page, rather. Um, all that remains for me tonight is to say thank you to my wonderful panellists, Lee, Zoe and Jonathan. Thank you for making this so much fun. Uh, and thank you to all of you at home who've been watching and submitting your questions, uh, especially um, who am I going to say a shout out to? Rhoda and Louise and Mary and, uh, you know, if I've missed anybody, thank you so much for your questions. The discussion wouldn't have been half as enlightening, with, enlightening without you. Um, please do tune in to the next episode. And in the meantime, stay safe and happy reading. <laughs>